so I suppose I should start by addressing the elephant in the room. And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, I am a huge downgrade on Father Andrew Burns. Uh, you know, I, I know him well. I worked with Father Andrew's dad, Deacon Peter Burns, at my first parish assignment at St. Tim's, and Father Andrew would stay with us at the rectory whenever he was on vacation and visiting his family in Florida. And, and yeah, so I got to know him well there. Uh, and he's an awesome priest. You know, he's, he's smarter than me. He's holier than me. He's nicer than me. Uh, he's skinnier than me. And despite being older than me, also has less gray hair than me. Um, so that's a battle I'm not even going to try and fight. I'll do my best to be a good priest, but I'm definitely worse than him. Um, I will say this. Uh, as my journey towards the priesthood kind of took root as I was growing up, there were really two major influences in my life. You know, one was uh, a fiery Cajun priest who became my pastor when I was eight years old at Light of Christ. Another was a young, witty vocations director who kind of kept me on the radar of all the discernment retreats and activities as I was going through high school and early college. So if at any point in the journey ahead you find yourself fed up with me, just remember that this is really Father Jacob and Father Len's fault to begin with as my childhood pastor and my vocation director. Um, thank you for laughing. It's mostly a joke. Uh, but in truth, uh, in hu or in humor, there is truth uh, very often. And, and I will say, now, when I first got the call to come here to Christ the King, I was excited, um, but I was also uh, nervous. You know, I had this nervousness. I had maybe even a little bit of insecurity. You know, I know Christ the King well. You know, it, it's really held in our diocese as, as one of the crown jewels, just a very awesome parish community full of uh, competent and capable and holy people. And if there's anything that I am confident in of myself, it's in my own weakness, you know, my own mess, my own incompetence in many ways, uh, which is why it's so reassuring for me, comforting to hear St. Paul in the second reading speak of his weakness and his struggle with weakness, a reading I always love to, to pray with and to hear. We don't really know what exactly that weakness was. You know, there's a bunch of different theories, you know, what that thorn in the flesh was for Paul. Um, but whatever it was, I know that I can relate to it. You know, I, I can count a number of times in middle school and in high school and in college and in seminary where I would have this desperate, often even angry prayer with the Lord pleading for him to remove my own weaknesses, you know, aspects of who I was that I hated, you know, whether it was something with me physically or whether it was something about my personality that I disliked or some skill or talent or gift that I wanted but didn't have or some sin or temptation that I didn't want but did have and couldn't seem to overcome. You know, all of these prayers to the Lord asking him, like Paul did, could you remove this from me? Could you take this away? I don't want this. Um, and time and time again, the Lord didn't come and, and snap his fingers and fix me. You know, he didn't come and, and remove that thorn. But time and time again, over and over, Jesus Christ came to me there in my weakness and he loved me there in my weakness. And he pulled me there in my weakness towards himself, towards his heart, his power, made perfect in weakness. And so I, I hope and I expect God once again to pop in and do something with my weakness here at Christ the King. I suspect he will. It's what he does. But I also suspect that I'm not the only person who struggles with this. Gosh, I hope I'm not the only person who struggles with my own weakness. You know, in every community, but I think particularly in a community where there is so much goodness and in a community with Christ the King that, that knows success and, and drive and, and passion and, and holiness and, and all these different things, there's this pressure that can build you know, with the, the comparison and with the expectation. And, and it can all kind of build for us to 
hate our, our weakness, you know, to resent our mess. And we try to, you know, fit in or to kind of keep pace with others or to match other different, you know, social media profiles or to kind of put on appearances until we can kind of fake it until we make it. You know, there's this stuffing down or hiding of our struggle. And we, we start to resent it. We, we, so we stuff it down. We, we try to ignore it. We, we chase after different things to distract us from it. And maybe if we're, you know, successful, um, we can get to the place where we can convince ourselves that that weakness isn't really there anymore. It's an equally crazy and dangerous place for us to be. But probably most dangerously is as we make these moves to reject our own weakness, we can start to reject what we perceive as Jesus's weakness. You know, because the reality is Jesus often works more simply, more slowly, more weirdly than we would like or expect often in our world, in our families, in our own lives. You know, he's not uh, flashy or spectacular. He's meek and humble. And worst of all, especially when things are difficult in our lives or in our family or in the world around us, oftentimes it can look like Jesus is not really successful or powerful at all. You know, we can get that same mentality as the ancient Israelites. You know, we want that conquering king who's going to come in and defeat our enemies and bring us with him into this place of power or comfort or status in the world. We desire that. When he does something different, we can reject that. Just like the ancient Israelites, just like the friends and neighbors of Jesus in Nazareth, when we harden our heart to our own weakness and our own struggle, we can start to harden our heart to the activity of our God who has chosen to carve a path towards victory that looks a lot like defeat, who has chosen to save us not through some grand, exciting parade of glory, but has chosen to save us through suffering, and through brokenness, and through the cross. This is our God. This is power made perfect. And just like the people in the times of Scripture, we can be so uneasy with that. We can struggle with our own weakness, with our own brokenness, and with his as well. Where am I going with all this? You know, what is, I don't have any kind of uh, fancy sort of takeaway from my first homily here at Christ the King. But I do know that I am so grateful for God dashing my ego against the ground over and over again, crushing my pride in so many different ways and reaching in in my moments of weakness, in my moments of sin, in my moments of pain and anger and loneliness and frustration and confusion of meeting me there and pulling me towards himself. He's so, so good, and I'm so grateful. As for you, um, I don't think you necessarily have to shout your greatest flaws or your biggest weaknesses from the rooftops. But what I would propose is maybe tonight that as Jesus comes to us once again, broken and shared in the almost embarrassingly simple form of bread and wine in the Eucharist, that maybe as he comes to us like that, that we can approach him in the same way. You know, with walls and appearances and all those different things we build up around ourselves come tumbling down. And to come forward as we are, you know, with our grace mixed with our mess. And allow him 
to make us whole, to allow him to prove to us once again in a personal and beautiful way that his power is made perfect in our weakness.